Welcome to Chit Heads from Embodied Philosophy. I'm your host, Jacob Kyle. In each episode of this podcast, I interview a different elder, leader, or teacher from the yoga and wider wisdom community on topics ranging from Eastern philosophy and practices to consciousness studies, social justice, and the human spiritual condition. If you like what you hear, please help us share these teachings with others by leaving us a review on iTunes. And of course, be sure to check out our writings and other educational materials on embodiedphilosophy.com. Thanks so much for listening. Hi, everyone. Welcome back. Before we get into today's interview, I just wanted to tell you about our upcoming conference, our third online conference called Radical Body, Living Tantra for Modern Life. This is going to be a free online conference that is exploring the teachings of tantric Shaivism, Kundalini, and the chakras. It's going to be from February 24th to 26th, 2017, so just over a month away from now, from the time of the release of this podcast. And the speakers are going to include Anadea Judith, Christopher Thomas, Tompkins, uh, Kundalini teacher Hari, Christopher Harish Wallace, Swami Kecharanata, Lauren Roche, Mary Riley Nichols, Pandit Rajmani Tiganate, Ramesh Bionis, Sally Kempton, Shambhavi Saraswati. All of these 11 speakers are going to be giving 11 different talks exploring uh, things related to Shiva and Shakti, chakras and psychology, consciousness and energy, embodiment and expansion, ecology and the divine feminine, kundalini and grace, and transformation and illumination. So if you'd like to sign up for that uh, free online conference, you can go to em- Radical Body dot embodied philosophy dot com so that's radical body dot embodied philosophy dot com I have been noticing that there's some issues if you are working on the internet from Verizon um, Wi-Fi. So if you have some issues finding the page, you can also find the page at 5tatvas.com slash radical dash body. 5tatvas.com slash radical dash body. In other news, we'll be going to Costa Rica here, middle of March. Myself and Patricia Pinto and her company, Love Surf Yoga, will be headed to the Osa Peninsula of Costa Rica. If you'd like to learn more about that offering, head to 5tatvas.com slash retreats. And just to fill you in a little bit on today's interview with Eddie Stern, I actually interviewed Ashtanga yoga teacher Eddie Stern in front of a live studio audience at Cooley Yoga Project in Williamsburg, Brooklyn. This was actually the first of a series of live interviews of Chit Heads at Cooley Yoga Project. We had a Q&A with the members of our audience after the interview. And if you'd like to hear that Q&A, you can download that audio by going to the dedicated Eddie Stern podcast page at eddiestern.embodiedphilosophy.com. Again, that's eddiestern.embodiedphilosophy.com. And if you just scroll down the page, there's a button and you can uh, sign up to receive that audio to your inbox. And if you'd like to hear more about other opportunities to go to these live interview recordings, You'll also receive information about that once you uh, sign up to receive that audio from uh, of Eddie Stern's Q and A. So we hope you enjoy this talk. It was a real pleasure to interview such a esteemed yoga teacher here in New York City, and of course, it was also really fun to be in front of a live audience as well. So I hope you enjoy it. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to a very special episode of Chit Heads. Very special, not only because I'm here with Ashtanga yoga teacher Eddie Stern but also because this is the first of a series of live recordings in front of a live studio audience here at Kula Yoga Project in Williamsburg, Brooklyn. So uh, live studio audience, would you mind saying hello? Awesome. So to introduce our guest today, Eddie Stern is the co-founder of Ashtanga Yoga New York, the Brooklyn Yoga Club, and the Broom Street Ganesha Temple. He studied Ashtanga Yoga under Sri K. Patabi Joyce of Mysore, South India, for 18 years. Eddie has published several books on Patabi Joyce and Ashtanga Yoga, including a translation of Patabi Joyce's 1960 treatise, Yoga Mala. He co-founded the Urban Yogi Program along with Deepak Chopra and Erica Ford, which introduces inner city youth to yoga and meditation, teaching them powerful transformative tools that they can bring back into their communities, with some of the youth becoming teachers themselves. 
Eddie also leads a team that writes health and wellness curriculums based on yoga and mindfulness for underserved public school districts, which has been implemented in over 100 schools. His school wellness protocols have been studied by the University of San Diego, Long Island University, and Stanford University, showing increases in GPA, attendance, and physical fitness. So with that, hello, Eddie. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. So um, it's such a pleasure to be able to talk to you in front of this uh, live audience today. Um, so I want to start just in the way we often start these interviews by having you tell us a little bit about yourself and maybe the story that brought you to yoga. Uh, okay, so my name is Eddie Stern. I'm from New York City, a native New Yorker. Um, I grew up in Greenwich Village. And um, I think what brought me to yoga? That's what yeah. you want to know? Yeah, your whole story. <laughs> uh, well, I guess um, I did some yoga at summer camp, mm -hmm. and I liked it. Uh, I believe it was probably Shivananda yoga. Mm -hmm. um, maybe I was 15 years old or so. And anyone here ever done Shivananda yoga? Shivananda yoga is the best kind of yoga ever because you get to slide, lie down and sleep in between every pose. <laughs> <laughs> and um, they always do this deep relaxation at the end of class. And um, so when we were doing this at this camp I was at, I would go into, like, like everyone else, into a total nowhere zone. Mm -hmm. Like it wasn't sleep, it wasn't anything, you're just gone. And then the teacher would bring us out of it. And I remember thinking, uh, this is really very interesting and cool and I wanted to do it when I went home but I was worried that if I went home and did this final relaxation I would no one would know how to bring me out of it because I thought that the teacher knew like the secret technique to bring us out from from the you know what they the called shavasana and um, so I thought well okay what if I do this thing and I'm like gone into the, into the darkness and my parents like see me on the floor but they don't know where I am or what's <laughs> happening to me and they can't get me out from it then I would be stuck. Yeah. And I was worried about being stuck. And um, so I didn't do it again. And um, I remember, because I lived in Greenwich Village on West 4th Street and 6th Avenue, at the time, that's where Dharma Mitra had his school. It was mm. his second school. And I used to walk by it all the time, and I would see the sign for yoga. He had a neon sign that said yoga. He was, like, really ahead of the times. <laughs> wow. And um, Dharma was always ahead of the times. And I, I was always thinking to myself, oh, I should go in, you know, I should go in, but I was intimidated, so I didn't. How old were you at this time? Uh, I was like 15 or 16. Oh, wow. Okay. Very um, early. And then I graduated from high school, uh, and um, I started working in a record store called Bleaker Bob's, and uh, it's no longer there. Um, and one of the guys who worked in the record store had done yoga with Amrit Desai, who mm -hmm. some of you might know Amrit Desai. He was the Swami who started the Kripalu Center, which is in Lenox, Massachusetts. And then uh, he was in a very strange um, setup with his ashram there because he was an employee of the ashram as a guru, which is like weird and kind of probably unprecedented. And he got involved with some of the people in the ashram in a way that Swamis are not supposed to. And he got fired. Um, and so I had gone, well, my friend who I was working with at Bleaker Bob's had studied with Amrit Desai in the 1970s. Mm. This didn't happen until the 1990s. So um, he showed me some stuff, and, I, and it was mainly meditation type things and a little chanting, not really asanas. Mm. And I was very intrigued by, by this whole thing. So um, that was really my first introduction to... Um, the way we thought about yoga then was all about samadhi, raising your kundalini, and enlightenment. We didn't think about yoga poses at all. I barely, I didn't really know what they were. Um, but the whole conversation on yoga was, what will happen when we get enlightened? Yeah. And we we're like, well, maybe we'll start a band, or you know. <laughs> and you did start a band, correct? Uh, no, I had already quit. Oh, you'd music already quit like your band. Yeah, I'd already quit by then. So music was very early for you. It was, yeah. Mm -hmm. And you were in the punk scene, is that correct? I was, yeah. Nice. For the most part. No, we, we weren't quite in the punk scene. We actually, I was in a band called Chop Shop, and we started a genre of music. We didn't know this, but we started a genre of wow. music in the Lower East Side that later became known as Scum Rock. Scum rock. Yeah, because I guess we're all such scumbags or something. Is but there a we Wikipedia were, page for scum rock? I don't think there is. <laughs> you might need to make one. <laughs> it's too late for that. <laughs> so we were influenced not by punk rock movement, but 
bands like The Cramps and um, The Birthday Party and stuff like that. So it's all. I'm ashamed to say I have no idea who those people mm, are. Nobody but will I, at this point. I'm going to look so it up later. Don't <laughs> waste your time on the internet. <laughs> So, um, obviously, a lot of us know you here as an Ashitanga teacher, so I'm curious what part of the whole story uh, Patabi Joyce and Ashitanga came into the picture. Um, I went to India in 1988 um, to go take a teacher training at Shivananda, mm. and the next year, I and after the teacher training, I traveled around India for about four months. Um, I started down in South India, in Kerala, which is you all know it's the very tip of India, and then I traveled by bus and by train all the way up to Kathmandu mm -hmm. in Nepal, which took a, a while and was really tiring, <laughs> and we stopped at temples and holy places along the way, and then we came back down through Delhi and then through Rajasthan, and then after four months I went home, and um, along the way we would go and wherever we saw a sign for a yoga class, which was not very often, we would go take the class, so we were really on a we were on a quest, you know? Yeah. Um, and um, then a year passed, and a friend of mine was going to be going to take the teacher training again. And I'd spoken to the Swami who had, had led mine, and he said, oh, do you want to come help teach the teacher training? And I said, sure. So I went back to India for a second time. I didn't re think I'd ever go back to India again. It wasn't like in my plans. Um, and that time, uh, we started in the north, and traveled south mm -hmm. instead of the opposite way, doing the same type of thing. And when we got down to Mysore, I'd, we'd gone through Mysore the first time. When we got back down to Mysore, uh, we attended lectures on Vedanta for a week. And it was they were being given by a man named Swami Dayananda. And we were attending his lectures in the Jagan Mohan Palace, which was part of the Maharaja's big palace. It was sort of the, the art um, gallery wing of the palace. And on the last day of the lectures, I was early, and I went into a, a communist bookstore, which was next to the palace grounds. And I was just wasting some time looking around. And there was the old man who owned the store said, what are you doing in India? As we were asked all the time. And I said, I came to India to try to learn some yoga. And he said, there's a great master here in Mysore. Um, have you um, met Patabi Joyce? Mm. And I said, no, I've in fact never heard of him. And he said, oh, you should go meet him. And I said, do you know his address? And he said, yeah, he lives next to the police station <laughs> in Lakshmi Puram. So I said, fabulous. And I went to the lectures. And then the next day, I got in a rickshaw in the morning after I'd finished my practice. And I said, I'm going to the Lakshmi Puram police station. And the driver said, OK. And he took me there. And then um, I got off. And the man in the bookstore said he lived opposite the police station. And op opposite the police station, there was a road. So I just walked down it. Mm. And after two houses, I saw a tiny little sign on the left that said Ashtanga Yoga Nilayam. And uh, so I knocked on the door. And uh, this fat guy wearing a <laughs> dish towel opened the door. <laughs> and I said, um, yeah, I'm looking for Patabi Joyce. And he said, that's me. And I thought, how can, is that possible that this is a yoga teacher? <laughs> so he invited me in. And, uh, and his wife came out, Amma, and they started talking to me. And they were saying, um, oh, yeah, we have many students visiting from around the world. And, um, you know, you have to come for one month. And I said, well, I'm leaving tomorrow to go to the BR Hills. And he gave me his card and said, you can come next time. Just write me in advance. Mm. So then the next year, uh, then I got back to New York after a few months. And I told um, my uh, yoga school friends that um, – uh, about all the different people I'd met on the trip. And I got to Mysore, and I said, and I met this guy in Mysore named Patabi Joyce. He's a big guy wearing a dish towel, and uh, you know, I, I don't know what he was teaching. And they said, oh, we've heard of him. We really want to study with him. And I had no idea what Ashtanga Yoga was. I didn't know what it looked like. I didn't know anything about it at all. And I said, well, okay, um, if we go back next year, I was already planning my next trip, um, I, you know, I can write him a letter, and we can go study with him. So I wrote him a letter. And um, he wrote back. Well, actually, his granddaughter, um, Shimmy, wrote back and said, yeah, you can come. It's $200 a month and a $25 registration fee, and let us know when you're coming. And so we went. Mm. Now, um, from what I understand, you didn't, at one point, you didn't have a high opinion of Patabi Joyce. No. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I, I didn't. In fact, the, well, there's a couple things. One, um, my first impression of him was that you know, who's this big 
fat guy in a, in a dish towel. Like that, so my ex expectations of what a yoga teacher should be were a little bit, you know, I was used to Shivananda, I was used to Swamis, some of them were quite fat also actually. <laughs> and um, I was used to chanting in the classes and philosophical talks and I was used to the whole like, you know, ashram India trip. Yeah. That's what I mean. My first experiences going to Kripalu and going to these places were a lot of devotion and a lot of stuff like that. And um, so it was weird for me to be in a situation uh, in a yoga school in India where all the Westerners were like wearing Western clothing and eating kind of Western food for the most part and being normal Western people. And I thought, well, and here I was like w completely dressed in white all the time with long flowing hair and wow. my friends who I traveled with were always in dhotis or in saris and we were doing like the whole India trip but we were doing like a really haughty egotistical holy, very, you know, holy. very you know we are you know we all thought we were Jesus and <laughs> Mary and Joseph um, <laughs> and so we came into this with a mindset of this is what yoga is and this is how it should be done and this is what the guru should talk about like everyone called him Guruji and I couldn't bring myself to call him Guruji um, I thought, this, that's not what it is, you know? Yeah. Like, I, like I knew, like some kid from the Greenwich Village, you know, the Greenwich Village, from Greenwich Village in New York. <laughs> the other India. Like, <laughs> knew what a guru was supposed to be or what they were supposed to behave like. Mm -hmm. So I had all these preconceptions coming into it, and he didn't fit into any of them. So it was just my own arrogance that, um, that led me to form these opinions. Mm. And uh, then, uh, after, at a certain point, I felt like um, he there was something I could really learn from him, that he could see more about me than I could see about myself. And at that point, those things started like weakening in me a little bit. Mm. It was a little, not too much. Not a little. Mm -hmm. Not a whole lot. <laughs> <laughs> it was a touch. Just enough to let me, you know, learn some practice. Well, well, and of course, I imagine encountering a teacher that slaps up against your preconceived notions is a, is a process of looking at yourself, right? Because you are looking, you're, you're forced to kind of um, analyze your own you know, baggage. That's the best kind of teacher to have. Mm. Um, if, uh, if you go to a spiritual teacher and they live up to every single little beautiful thing that you're expecting, then all you're doing is fulfilling your own, um, you know, narrative and imagination of yeah. what it is that you want. Mm -hmm. And a spiritual practice is not about what we want. It's about um, something different. Mm. Uh, it's mm. about getting out of that um, whole field of mind which is going to figure it all out and, and, and achieve its objective. Yeah. Um, so, and that usually means that we're shaken up a little bit. Mm. If you're not shaken up, then it's probably not spiritual practice. Mm. It's hedonism. Mm. Wow, I feel like that's a really important point and I want to come back to it. Um, so, now I want to talk a little bit about um, the Broom Street Temple which you formed in, f is it 1989? The temple was started in 2001. <laughs> Clearly, I was off by a few That's years. Okay. So, um, so the Broom Street Temple, you know, it, it strikes me that it was called a temple. And so I would love to talk a little bit about, you know, your choice um, to call it a temple instead of a yoga studio and, and maybe um, move into kind of a reflection on, on, on the relationship between yoga to you and the spiritual, uh, which is, you know, seems to be increasingly... Uh, detached from each other in in maybe modern the yo the modern yoga scene. Okay, well, um, first of all, the our school that we opened was called Ashtanga Yoga New York. Mm, okay, um, we started it in 1993, and um, we we were in a Hare Krishna center for a while, so it wasn't an official school. Um, then we opened up on Broadway in Houston, and we were there for five years. Originally, it was called the Patanjali Yoga Shala. Uh, no, originally it was called Ashtanga Yoga Nilayam, and it was Guruji's like branch of the school in New York. And then some of the Indian organization of the Ashtanga Yoga schools in India asked us to not use that name, but use a separate one for America. Mm. So then Guruji's wife, Amma, said we should call it Patanjali Yoga Shala. <laughs> so then we changed the name to Patanjali Yoga Shala. And then around 2000, um, Sharat said that he wanted the schools to have cohesive names around the, the, the world and he was thinking that we should all use the word Ashtanga Yoga and then our city name after it. So would I be the first to do that and call our school Ashtanga Yoga New York? So then we changed our name to Ashtanga Yoga New York. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, around 2001, 
we, we had always had a small temple in the school, but in 2001, when we moved into this nicer space, I wanted to establish more of an uh, authentic temple. So I asked Guruji for permission if we could install a, a deity in the school and begin worshiping it. And he said yes, because he had taught me some chanting and some worship already. And um, so he said we should install a, a murti or a form of Ganesha. So then we decided to call it the um, uh, Sri Ganesha Temple. And we called the school Ashtanga Yoga New York and the Sri Ganesha Temple. And so that was our name from 2001 going forward. And then around 2005 and 2006, we decided to become a religious nonprofit cor corporation mm. so that the temple could begin accepting donations and do outreach work and stuff like that. So then we separated the temple off from the school. Ashtanga Yoga New York stayed that, and the Sri Ganesha Temple became the Broom Street Temple. I see. So, um, long story short, we've never kept a name for very long. <laughs> <laughs> then we moved to Brooklyn, <laughs> and then we opened the Brooklyn Yoga Club. Mm. But downstairs in the Brooklyn Yoga Club, where we have the yoga classes, it's still called Ashtanga Yoga New York. Okay. And now we're about to rebuild the temple. Oh, amazing. But we're not on Broom Street anymore. Right. So we're... Can't <laughs> be the Broom Street Temple. <laughs> <laughs> so it won't be called the Broom Street Temple. I'm terrible at naming. I'm amazed that my daughter still has the same name. <laughs> it's been 16 years after all. <laughs> so the... Um, well, almost 17. So the temple itself is that we established on Broom Street was definitely... Um, an authentic um, South Indian Hindu yeah. temple. And we had priests come over who did a prana pratishta, or the establishment of the energy in the deity that brings it to life. And we maintained it with worship and festivals and everything. And we'll continue to do the same in Brooklyn. Amazing. Um, so why did I want to start a temple uh, is really the question, I guess. And um, the first trip that I had in India where we were going from city to city and temple to temple over those four months or so, what we were doing was we would go to a, ho a holy place and we'd stay there for a few days and we would practice in the temples. And we'd find a quiet corner because a lot of them are huge sprawling complexes. That, uh, they cover many, many acres and they're old and they're made out of stone and they're dark corners and you feel like you're just in you know, sacred caves. So we'd find a quiet corner We'd roll out our straw mats, because we didn't have any sticky mats, and um, do some practice. We'd do pranayama and asanas and chanting and meditate. And that was where we did all of our practices. So for me, yoga came alive in all of these temples in India. And that's what I always sort of resonated with. I didn't really um, learn so much in like a classroom setting as I did like in those temples, mm. where I felt this is what spirituality is to me. Mm. That's where it came alive. Yeah. What was the significance of Ganesha? Like, why Ganesha instead of another deity? Um, it was Ganesha because that's what Guruji said to install. Okay, excellent. It's a good reason. Exactly. All right. If so it was up to me, I would have had such a hard time choosing. <laughs> you know, I w honestly, I would have been like, well, who's the best God? <laughs> <laughs> you know, and then you read about all like the you know, the, the powers that the gods have, and I'll be, okay, well, Shiva is pure consciousness, but, you know, Saraswati is knowledge, do I want her? You know, mm. so I wouldn't be able to choose because I would be way too mundane and goal-oriented around, like, who to install. Yeah, yeah. And I never had a pull towards Ganesh. So my wife did, but I never did. And so when Guruji said, I was more pull, pull towards, like, North Indian-style Radha Krishna worship and mm. everything. And so when he said Ganesh, I said, okay, you know, great. It's another example of slapping up against what you might have expected or wanted to do. Um, no, I really, at that point, no. At that point, okay. I was like, whatever he said, I, I thought was going to be right. And I, was, and I felt so happy that he said we could do it, mm -hmm. that um, whoever he said to install, I would have installed in worship. He had said install Mother Mary, I would you know, I oh. have done that. That would have been cool. That would have been totally radical. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I want to ask um, now, you know, obviously I want to move into kind of a, a, a wider discussion about contemporary yoga culture, which those that listen to the podcast know I love to talk about. Um, and, and the way I, got, I guess I want to start doing this is, um, hi, Aaron, uh, because we, you know, obviously are in, in a period now where we're post the modern yoga asana guru, 
um, you know, with, with the loss of Patabi Joyce and Iyengar. Um, and, I'm, and so I'm curious about what your observations are about y the yoga culture now that this, that these kinds of, these heavyweights and these, these maybe pillars of our community are gone. Okay. Um, first of all, the um, modern yoga, what did you call them? Asana, modern Mo yoga asana. Modern yoga asana <laughs> teachers. Yeah. So I don't believe in this. Okay. Um, uh, I believe that or accept that maybe in the past 20 years in America that we could say, okay, this is some sort of modern yoga type of thing. Um, or that much of what's being done now has been created by Westerners and really uh, doesn't have a whole lot to do with the way that asanas were practiced in India. But up until the point of um, Krishnamacharya uh, and Patabi Joyce, I really do not think that what they were teaching and what they were doing was influenced by the West mm -hmm. as Mark Singleton and Elizabeth de Michelis and others are claiming. Mm -hmm. um, I think that whole argument that they've been putting forward um, it has many flaws, and yeah. I think the flaws are coming out um, by scholars yeah. and not by people like me who just um, learn from oral tradition. Yeah. Uh, so I'm looking forward to the whole kind of you know modern yoga conversation to be reframed around. Um, what it really might be, which is a lot, lot later than the 1920s in India. Yeah. So yeah, there was a lot of back and forth um, between um, the new transcendentalist movement in America and um, the Brahmo Samaj in Calcutta. Uh, there was back and forth with a whole lot of different things. Um, Krishnamacharya was not part of any modernist movement because he was so rigidly educated in traditional Indian or Hindu Shastric traditions. He was uh, a, a deep scholar, a true scholar uh, um, of, of his tradition. And even if you read in Yoga Makaranda, his earliest book, uh, he talks about the influence that the West is having on India and how if India doesn't protect what really is rightly it, hers, that it's going to be polluted yeah. um, by the Western influence. So I can't imagine that anyone who spoke in the 1930s about protecting India's cultural heritage from the West is going to then look at British military gymnastics and say, hey, that's pretty cool. I'm going to use some of that. Yeah. My, there's no need for it. Um, yeah, I so mean, I, I want to just say one thing about that because um, I, I actually had intended to talk to you about Yoga Body, um, which, you know, despite how compelling the wider community seems to be think that it is I don't find it very compelling either and and so I just want to reframe what I said I don't when I'm saying the modern yoga asana I'm not trying to do something that's sort of inspired by that because I mm -hmm. think people like Christopher Tompkins who's also on your side here mm -hmm. he's in, in fact his whole like work is about um, showing how m a lot of these asanas can be found in you know medieval manuscripts mm -hmm. uh, including Surya Namaskar which has been said in Yoga Body to be from you know the Swedish gymnastic tradition so uh, so it's not so much that it's more that um, would you not agree that Krishnamacharya even though he was grounded in these traditions there was a innovativeness in 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 the way that he approached yoga as a craft? Well, I have no idea. In fact, none of us have any idea because uh, we don't know actually what Krishnamacharya learned. All we know is that he spent seven years in a cave, either in Tibet or near Varanasi, if you believe Guruji's version of the story, and that he learned a whole bunch of stuff from his guru, and then he came back uh, down south and started teaching it. So why would he not teach what he learned? Mm -hmm. You know, maybe he was taught that you need to adapt things to every individual, which would require you to be innovative. Um, but what yoga teacher in India, like, has not been innovative? Yeah. So if you look all the way back, let's take an example like Vishwamitra, who um, was uh, one of the rishis, one of the main rishis who we hear about in, the, in all of the Hindu epics. He was a king originally. His name was King Kaushika. 
And as a king, he was going one day with all of his troops surveying the land, and he came across a little hermitage, and so they stopped to pay respect to the sage who was there, and it was the sage Vashishta. Mm -hmm. And Vashishta said, stay, sit down, and let me feed all of you. And the king Kaushika said, um, there's like 10,000 of us. You won't be able to feed us. It's a lot of food, so don't trouble yourself. We're just going to be on your way. We're just paying our respects. And Vashishta said, don't worry. It's okay. I'll, I'll, we'll take care of it. Um, my, my cow will prepare the food. And so it just happened to be that Vashishta had a wish-fulfilling cow, and all he had to say to the cow was, please prepare food for all the troops, and poof, she did a nice, you know, 17-course meal, and everyone ate happily. Food was delicious, perfectly cooked, and King Kaushika was blown away, and he said, you have to give me this cow. I need her. And Vashishta said, she's not my cow to give. I can't give her to you, even if I wanted to, because she's not mine. And King Kaushika said, give me the cow or I'm going to take her by force. And Vashishta said, well, you know, try it. And um, the king came rushing at him with his troops and um, with a mantra, he blew away half of the troops. Mm -hmm. And at that point, the king was enraged. He sent the rest of the troops at Vashishta. Vashishta picked up a blade of grass, blew on it, threw it into the ground and destroyed the rest of the troops. And the king said, the strength of the kshatriya, the warrior that I have, is nothing compared to the strength of the rishi. I want what you have. And he gave up his kinghood and then went on the path to become a rishi. Now, along the way to becoming a rishi, he had to you know, stand on one toe for 10,000 years repeating mantras, and he had to do all these things that are impossible for us to do in this day and age. <laughs> and, and he kept on achieving different levels of rishihood, but Vashishta was a Brahma Rishi, which is the best kind of Rishi. Mm. And Vishwamitra, well, King Kaushik at that point, he wanted to be the best kind of Rishi. And he wanted to be recognized by Vashishta as being the best Rishi also. It wasn't enough that he was going to be like a seer and like a sage. He wanted to be the best kind of a sage. And not only did he want to be the best sage, he wanted Vashishta to recognize him as such. And so he had his falls from grace, and he had went back up, and blah, blah, blah. And along the way, he had to be creative with his tapas, because mm -hmm. he was going to do whatever he needed to do to keep his mind one-pointed. And that was going to involve different things. And he was thrown off by, you know, beautiful um, uh, uh, apsaras who are like, you know, heavenly angels um, who seduced him. And um, he created universes for different people that he was then asked to not create because it was throwing everything out of balance. So he did all this stuff. He did some cool stuff. He did some not so cool stuff. And he, everyone here has heard of the Gayatri Mantra. The Gayatri Mantra was discovered by Vishwamitra. That was his enlightening experience that all the different rishis have brought mantras into the world. And he brought the Gayatri Mantra. And so this was something no one else had discovered before him. It was existing, but he was the one who pulled it into existence. Mm. Um, so he had to be innovative. He made important discoveries. Um, he changed the world through mantra and through tapas. And he became an inspiration for billions of people across many, many thousands of years because of what he did. But no one ever accused him of being a modern rishi. Yeah. You know? <laughs> he wasn't put into a category of like, yeah. oh, you know, you did this and you created it. You're a modern rishi. You know, that's going against the rules. So, so this idea of being innovative as going against tradition is a problem of the Western mind. Yeah. It's not a problem of the Indian mind. Yeah. So you have all these Western academics who are now studying the Indian tradition and superimposing their ideas about what tradition means on a tradition that is very fluid and very yeah. flexible and that we don't understand really at all. So there are unfair assumptions to make yeah. based on what the academia has outlined for all of these scholars as how you have to study. Mm -hmm. So if you're from Oxford, um, like Mark Singleton or like Elizabeth D. Michelis, or you're from whatever university, those universities are going to give you your education, which is going to be based on particular Western paradigms of understanding um, whether it's Darwinian or Freudian um, or Descartian 
um, you know, Western mechanics, et cetera, et cetera. That's going to be your frame of thinking for however you investigate anything. Uh, but the Indian tradition doesn't fit into that. Mm. It's a completely different frame of mind. So to try to uh, understand where they're coming from and what it means for them to have tradition, to pass down things, is going to say, well, this is how I see it and this is what it is. So now we have a whole um, small generation arising of uh, people who are trying to say, well, what you learn from Patabi Joyce, what you learn from Krishnamacharya is not authentic yoga mm -hmm. because blah. Yeah. And because blah, because I'm from this academia and this is how we see it, and so it is no. And that's a lot of the discourse right now. Mm -hmm. So there's a, there, there's, uh, the, it's the byproduct of our imposing of a kind of categorizing process. We have we no choice. Divide. We uh -huh. have no choice but to view the Indian tradition through the lens of our own education. Right. And it's only if we get rid of the lens of our education that we can understand the Indian tradition in that kind of way. And my guess is that the only way we can really truly understand that is to die and be reborn Hindu and okay. experience it from within that. Because I think that our, our worldview is too solidly formed. Uh, but what we can do is that we can learn some of these techniques and learn some of these tools and begin to apply them into our own lives and our own culture and then get our own understanding of what it means for us to be human at this particular time and place in the world that we're creating around us and try to help create a world um, and a lifestyle and community which is based on these principles um, that we have understood. And the principles are very simple. Mm -hmm. um, try to be kind, try to be loving, try to be thoughtful, try to live with awareness, try to understand awareness, try to understand what is awareness within you. Um, all of these things are not bound by culture, necessarily. Um, they're not bound by time or place or circumstance. Uh, they're just simple human qualities, and, and animals have these qualities as well, that we can display in our lives. Um, I think this is more important than trying to figure out where a sun salutation came from. Yeah, yeah, uh, definitely. Very frankly. Yeah. Um, so. Yeah, I love. I really love what you're saying because what I'm hearing you say is that there's nothing particularly remarkable about innovation in terms of like looking at the the wide breadth of the tradition because innovation has been it's normal a, an essential component to it the whole way through. Innovation is part of change. Right. Change is the nature of the world. Mm -hmm. There has always been change. There's always been innovation. So then, so then, let me ask you a question. Then, so what, what then um, would be the difference? And maybe there isn't one from this perspective. But what would be the difference from, say, the innovation of coming up with the Gayatri mantra, or hearing, or finding, or discovering the Gayatri mantra, and the innovation of today, like something like yoga booty ballet, or you know, icy hot aerial power chakra balancing yoga? <laughs> you know, because you know, what is the because now we're in a yoga in power booty ballet. Yoga booty ballet. It's yoga. a real thing. Is it? Yeah. I haven't done it myself. <laughs> <laughs> um, have you heard of goat yoga? Goat? Goat yoga? No. It's a real thing. <laughs> Google it. What's involved? Yeah. What's involved? Well, obviously goats. <laughs> <laughs> I'm afraid to ask more. Uh, it takes place on a farm. Where is that farm? Is it in Oregon or Oklahoma or something? Yeah, it's running all over the internet. And um, no, you just do yoga on a farm, and goats are walking around also, and okay. they might cuddle you. You don't do anything with the goats. Well, <laughs> downward facing goat pose. I don't know. <laughs> okay. The um, actually, it's funny. The first time I heard about goat yoga, which was a couple of days ago, from. Um, <laughs> Uh, someone who practices at our school, who is one of the directors of the Hindu American Foundation, who anytime there's anything going on in the yoga world, she says, have you heard about blah? And <laughs> says it to me like it's my fault. <laughs> like, what's wrong with you people? Because <laughs> she's an Indian. So she said, oh, have you heard of goat yoga? I said, no, I have not heard of goat yoga. She said, it's a thing. <laughs> um, and uh, I said, well, funnily enough, do you know what the word in Sanskrit is for goat, and she said no. And um, I said, it's aja. And aja, which is the word for goat, is also the word for the unborn. So like the unborn, pure, limitless consciousness is also called aja, unborn. 
It's also a similar word for goat. So anyway, she wasn't amused. <laughs> so what's the difference between um, something like yoga booty ballet mm -hmm. Um, and I mean, how how, how do is we, it okay? So how the, able I have to discern. An, I yeah. have a, I have my own answer for it. Okay, um, which is utterly simplistic, and um, I feel that there is truly a definition for yoga, and I think that definition for yoga is in Second Sutra of Patanjali Yoga Sutra, which is yoga is chitta vritti nirodha. The yoga is the stilling or selective elimination of the fluctuations in the field of consciousness, or the field of mind, let's mm -hmm. say mind rather than consciousness. Um, and when those fluctuations are stilled, or you've just chosen which fluctuation you are going to focus on for your concentration or meditation purposes, then that is a process and eventually a state of yoga. So if something is stilling all of the other fluctuations in your mind, with the exception of one of pure awareness, then um, you're doing yoga, a according to my read reading of Patanjali. If the next step after that is that then the self or your awareness remains as awareness itself and not as anything else. Mm -hmm. So if your awareness is getting mixed into anything else and identifying with any narrative whatsoever, then you're still not in a state of yoga. But if you only are existing as pure awareness, then you're in a state of yoga. Mm -hmm. So. If a practice is leading us towards chitta vritti nirodha, the stilling of all these fluctuations, and we're remaining as awareness itself um, at the end of that practice or within that practice, then I think it can get lumped into a yoga category because Patanjali never tells us exactly what or how to practice. He only tells us the effects of practices. So if, if you get the effect, then you can make the assumption, I've been doing the practice. Okay. But if you don't get the effect, then you might say, either I'm not doing it right or I'm not doing something which is really the practice. So theoretically, then somebody could... Can everyone follow me okay yeah. there? All right. Somebody could be practicing yoga, in a, according to the definition that you've outlined, mm -hmm. in Yoga Booty Ballet, for example. I don't know. I've never done it. <laughs> and, um, but theoretically. So I, but I don't know what they're teaching. Okay. So I can't say. I think we have to be specific. Okay. Um, and I think we have to be specific about teachers as well because I, I am not a firm believer in styles of yoga. Um, people say, oh, you know, you're an Ashtanga yoga teacher. And when they say I'm an Ashtanga yoga teacher, they already have in mind what that means for me to be for them. Mm -hmm. um, and as I said before, when I first went to Patabi Joyce, I had no idea what Ashtanga yoga was. I didn't know what it looked like. And I always say, had I known what it was, I never would have gone because I'm lazy by nature. <laughs> and I was really enjoying this Shivananda thing where you just get to lie on your back and <laughs> then you do a pose for a few minutes and you stretch as far as you can and you hang out there and then you go to sleep again. And that was really good for me. I liked it. Mm. But I recognized after about a year and a half or so or maybe a year that Patabi Joyce like, was my teacher. I just felt this thing that he has something to teach me, and I want to learn what he has to teach me. So I didn't go to him because I wanted to learn Ashtanga Yoga. And I didn't keep going back to him because I wanted to learn Ashtanga Yoga. I kept going back to him because year after year because I wanted to learn what he had to teach me. Yeah. And the thing that I originally really wanted to learn from him after about a year and a half or so, he didn't really want to teach me which was I wanted to learn how to do worship, I wanted to learn chanting, I wanted to learn Sanskrit. And when I asked him if he would teach me Sanskrit, he said, no, it's too difficult. It'll take too long. And it wasn't until um, about 1995, uh, so four years into it, that he agreed to teach me any chanting or Sanskrit. Mm. And that was only really after I you know, showed him that I was sincerely interested to learn. Mm. Um, and. Um, that came about because one day he gave a lecture. There were about, there were in the, those years, there weren't a whole lot of students there. So if there were 24 people there, it was like super packed. And so it, at that point, there were just like 20 people. And he gave a lecture on this prayer. And he said, you know, you can learn this prayer. It has the same positive effects as doing sun salutations. 
Nobody understood anything he was saying. <laughs> so a week later, he gave the exact same lecture and said, um, you know, if you learn this prayer, it'll have good effects on you and also similar like sun salutations. So I went out and I tried to find this prayer and it took me a few weeks to find exactly what it was and where it was. And it turned out to be a, um, a 30 verse prayer called the Aditya Hridaya. And I said, okay, I found it. Guruji, will you teach it to me? And he said, oh, you learn it by heart and then after I'll explain it to you. Mm. So then I went back on my own and without really knowing anything about it, I memorized it and I learned how to chant it the best I could. And um, then I went back and started trying to chant it for him. He said, no, 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 that's terrible. <laughs> and, uh, and then he started correcting it. And a little bit after that, he started teaching Sharat and I some Vedic chanting. Mm -hmm. um, but anything that he taught me, I had to memorize it first. Yeah. So um, even if it was five pages long. So uh, that's how strict he was with particular things. And, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, with the yoga side of things, I didn't have any like um, agenda for any of it. It was just whatever he was going to teach me, that's what I was going to learn and that's what I was going to practice because he knew better than I did in, in that realm. That's okay. how I felt. Um, so in that regard, I think that when you look at a system, you can't look at um, the actual physical nature of it or the structure of it as much as you should look at the person who is practicing yeah. it and what they've understood from it. So what I wanted from Guruji was his experience. I wanted to understood how did he look at people? How did he understand people? How did he know what to teach us? Um, that's what I was interested in. I wasn't interested in intermediate or advanced or whatever. Um, so I felt that he was giving us his experience of yoga through this particular sequence of poses. And, and when we practiced and did what he said to do and did things in a particular way, then we would understand the experience of yoga that he was talking about. Mm -hmm. And that whenever I started to change things, it didn't go quite as well. But whenever I did things the way he said to do them, things went a lot smoother and I had better effect from the practice. Mm -hmm. So I think with any tradition, it's same. It, it, the, the name of it doesn't matter as much as the experience of the person who's teaching it. And this goes back to a very important thing within the Indian tradition and within any teaching profession is that it's the teacher that matters. The subject matter doesn't matter that much because if you have a good teacher, they will be able to teach you anything and you'll learn it and you'll love it as, as much as they do if they love teaching. And if you have a terrible teacher, even if they're a genius and know everything about their topic, if they're a lousy teacher, you're not gonna learn anything about it and, you know, or you'll learn it wrong and maybe you'll hate the experience of learning it. Mm -hmm. So teaching and the experience of the teacher is what matters in any spiritual tradition. Um, the name of the practice is really secondary. The form of the practice is secondary because a form exists to carry experience. Um, Vishwamitra had an experience and in that experience he heard the Gayatri Mantra. And so if we meditate on Gayatri in a particular way, we will also have that experience. Mm. If we meditate in, in a wrong way, in a different way, it won't. And we might just enjoy singing it or something yeah. like that. Um, so, um, so the experience is universal, but the form is I think the changing. experience of awareness is universal. Mm. Um, and I think that forms always change okay. um, and ways of doing them always change. But there's a thread, you know, that goes from, uh, from a teacher to like Guruji is passing on his experience to Sharad and he's practicing and Sharad is practicing, passing that on to the thousands of people who come and practice with him. Mm -hmm. So there's this continuity, that's the thread. When we talk about lineage, that's the thing we're talking about being passed on is the experience. Yeah. Now, when a lot of the people who are going on and on about um, modern yoga and they say there is no cohesive yoga tradition going back past the past couple of generations, anytime someone says anything about a tradition of Ashtanga yoga or a lineage within a yoga tradition, they're wrong because no such thing exists because we don't see it in the texts. So this is, I don't know if you've heard this, but this is a lot of the conversation that there is no real yoga lineage. There is no real yoga tradition going back past a couple of hundred years. So this goes back to an earlier point that this is a misunderstanding of what's being carried by a lineage. 
the actual form of it is allowed to change. What's being passed down is the experience of the practitioner from a guru to a disciple or from a teacher to a student. Mm. And then the student practices and has their own experience. And then they bring that forward to their students as well. And that goes on and on and on and on and on. If awareness is at the root of it, then the thing that's being passed on is always going to be have this continuity. But if awareness is not at the root of all of it, then it's going to be something which is going to be changed by time, place, and circumstance. But awareness doesn't seem to be. Um, Do you see um, awareness getting lost in a lot of the expressions that are using the label yoga in our wider Western landscape? Well, I don't know because I'm really outside of the, the yoga, okay. the quote-unquote yoga world. Um, I don't know what is being taught. I don't know what people are doing. But uh, this is a story that I've, it's, it's my only reference point story, so it's the only one that I tell. But shortly after Guruji died, Patabi Joyce, my teacher, um, about a year and a half later, my uncle said to me, do you want to go to my yoga class with me? And um, I hadn't been in a yoga class since... 1990, maybe, 1991, only in Guruji school. And um, so I said, sure, why not? I'll go to your class. And so I went to the class with him. And um, it was absolutely, in my body and in my mind, horrendous. I hated every <laughs> single second of it. Um, it, like, either there was too much talking or when it moved fast, it moved so fast, like, I couldn't keep up. I was like, I'm just, you know, no. <laughs> And, um, and uh, I didn't like how the teacher was touching people and um, just the whole thing. Like, I was reviled. I was completely reviled. <laughs> but my uncle, like, everyone in his family was saying he's so much calmer now and he's nicer. He doesn't get angry so easily. He's lost, like, 30 pounds. His hips are really open. <laughs> <you know? laughs> and they were. You know, he could do a really nice pigeon pose. And this was a guy who, you know, he had, like, a lot of things like that that mm -hmm. were maybe frustrating for him and his family members. So he was a completely changed person, and for him, he was truly doing yoga. And it was having an effect on him like it had an effect, you know, like Ashtanga Yoga had on me. And so I could not fault what he was doing because I saw the effect was really beneficial. Mm. So what I figured was the person who was teaching him, that must be her experience of what it was to transmit yoga, for some bizarre reason, it transmitted a very similar thing to what I was experiencing. So I had to say, well, cool, we're both in the same boat. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that for the many millions of people who do yoga around the country, they all have similar transformations of heart, of mind, um, of emotion, of reactivity from doing these practices. And I think what it is is that the breathing um, that most people are doing in yoga is balancing out our nervous system and the stretching and the postures are also balancing out the different functions of our physiologies overall putting us into a more balanced and aware and receptive state and we start to change we notice things about ourselves we become um, more uh, receptive to observing how we work and how we operate so this seems to be a general thing through a lot of different yoga practices mm. Mm. Which yeah. is cool. Yeah, it's really cool. I, I, it's really refreshing to hear. You're very non-dogmatic about your, your attitude about other traditions and lineages. And I think it's really refreshing, especially because I think I have encountered Ashtangis who have a very dogmatic attitude about the practice. And it's like, this is the, this is the only way or this is the real way. So it's, 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 it's refreshing to, to talk to someone who's really, um, you just have a very open-minded view of the whole thing. Um, I'm probably wrong. <laughs> And humble, and humble. So, so now I want to I want to actually circle back to a question that I that I asked, uh, and then sort of um, took us on a, in another direction because I inappropriately used the categorizing word modern. So, I want to go back to and actually maybe ask it sort of slightly differently because I, I had asked the question about you know now that we're now that. Um, Iyengar and Patabi Joyce have passed away. What do you observe? And maybe, maybe we can make it more of a personal question. How has your practice um, changed at all, if it has, um, with the passing of your teacher? Okay. Um, 
May I talk about the word modern for a minute? Yes, please. Okay. Uh, the th one of the things also about modern yoga or modern anything is that, that every single time that we're in is the most modern time that they'll ever be right. when we're at the forefront of it. So right now we're at the most modern point in time that there ever has been. But in 10 years, it's going to be more modern. And so this is one of the language problems I have with the whole modern yoga movement. Like, mm -hmm. when does it stop being modern? <laughs> you know, uh, yeah. what word are you going to use next? And when did you... So even a thousand years ago, when people were doing headstands on the banks of the Ganges, you know, that was the most modern time there ever was. And they were doing the most innovative practices that have ever been done. Mm -hmm. People's minds were probably blown. Um, so... Just not, not to harp, but I just wanted to say that. I think yeah. that's an important thing for people to remember. Anytime you hear the word, someone say modern yoga, you have to question, what modern are they talking about? Because modern's always cutting edge. And um, unless you want to lump it into some category like um, the modern dance movement, or if there's like a classical period of art or the Renaissance, or, you know, if you want to, if they're trying to create this particular time period and say this was the time period of modern yoga, then they're creating something different and they need to articulate that. Mm -hmm. They need to say that we are looking at this as a movement that occurred in this 100 year time span. They haven't articulated that. Um, it's too loosey-goosey. It's yeah. bad philosophy and it's bad academia. So because they haven't, what I would suggest to them is say, why don't you talk about yoga in modern times as modern times change? Mm -hmm. And because yoga is always basically going to be the same when we think about the underpinning philosophical um, project of yoga, which has to deal with the mind. So our mind now is the same mind that people had 2,500 years ago or 5,000 5, years ago. When you read the text and you read the philosophy, from whether it's Socrates or Plato or Aristotle or any of the Indian ancients, you can see that they're dealing with the same types of things that we're dealing with today. They have the same type of philosophical inquiries that we have today. Yeah. So that the human mind has not really changed all that much in the past 5,000 years, if not longer. So the mind that was discussed in yoga 5,000 years ago is the same mind which is being discussed today. We're dealing with the same thing dealing with the same principles. So therefore, what we have is, we don't have modern yoga, but we have yoga as it's practiced in these modern times, because the yoga doesn't change. Mm -hmm. Only the times change. And how we relate to those times is gonna change as well. So I just suggest to all those people using that phrase, Can you say a few names about these people? Would you mind? Well, and like uh, I, we, you know, I know Mark Singleton. Yeah, Mark Singleton, uh, Matthew Remsky, Elizabeth D. Michelis, um, uh, David Gordon White. Yeah. Um, you know, they're not they're not bad people. I don't hate any of them. I don't even know any of them. <laughs> um, but I read what they write, and I read the language they use, and their language is influential. And people say to me, well, "You should write something," you know, or I don't have time, frankly. <laughs> and also, I'm not a terribly good writer, and you know, where am I going to publish it? I don't want to put it on Huffington Post because you know too many people on that already and where are you going to publish it and you know, all that stuff you have to think about so I just we'll don't just bother. point people to this podcast instead I just have <laughs> instead I just form opinions all day long you know and, and, and think that I'm right so there's um, a little bit of um, a little bit of uh, of refinement of what it is that we're actually talking about needs to be done are there problems with the yoga community now yes um, we can look to Bikram, we can look to John Friend, we can look to Jiva Mukti, we can look to problems within my own community as well, the Ashtanga Yoga community. Um, every community has a problem. They always have had a problem. You know, Socrates was poisoned. You know, he had to drink hemlock. Now that's a major problem. Um, we're not going that far right now. So every community has a problem. You have to deal with those problems, accept those problems, be forgiving, and find out what was the thing that we started doing originally, what was the thing that brought us here that we wanted to do, that somehow we went a little bit off to the side, you know? Mm. That um, we were following this compass, but our compass was just one degree off, and all of a sudden I ended up like way over here when actually I was heading over here. And how am I gonna scoop myself back around? And communities do that too, they go off target 
you know? Look yeah. at Rajneesh in the 1980s in, in America. Now, that was like a bad story. Mm. Poisoning the water supply and, you know, and, and all this kind of stuff. So, um, but, uh, so th it's not to say that there's any, you know, there's no utopian co um, so, uh, community. There's no utopian type of practices. They're all going to have problems. We can learn from those problems. But what were the things that people were doing originally that made them want to go in that direction? Yeah. Um, and that is a search for knowing who you truly are. Mm -hmm. And in the search for wanting to know who we are, sometimes we get led astray. Yeah. But we always have to come back to it. We always have to come back to it. Um, so, um, and, uh, you know, so therefore you can't categorize that as being stuck in one particular time or yeah. place. It is the search which has been going on for thousands of years and will continue to go on for thousands of years. And, and it's a search that we're all taking part in right now. Um, that many people are taking part in right now. Mm. So, um, thank you. That's you know, I think that's such an important message. Yeah. yeah. Um, so now I want to maybe shift gears a little. Yeah, I bit. didn't answer your last question. I forgot. Oh right. Yeah. Oh, do you want to answer that question? We've now sure. got circled away from it a that's couple okay. times. I, I, <laughs> I'm sorry. I uh, I'm bad at answering questions. <laughs> No, I think what you're talking good at about having is really, opinions. It's really important. The what was the question a minute ago? The question was, um, n what has been the impact upon you and your practice ah. since your teacher has right. passed? Right, okay. Um, so the impact on my practice is unchanged. Mm -hmm. um, I continue to practice. I love practicing yoga. Um, I um, feel that my practice I is even better now than it was when I was younger. Meaning that not that I'm stronger and more flexible, but that I'm able to appreciate more and more the um, just the being in my breath, being in my body, being in my mind, um, my awareness of what I'm doing it as I'm doing it. You know, s when you pay attention, attention starts to pay itself to you too. That's something yeah. that's said a lot, you know, and and it's very true. So when you pay attention in your practice, you learn things, um, and uh, and the attention that you're paying. The awareness that you're generating, uh, you're not really generating awareness, but the awareness you open up to teaches you something. And so that learning never stops. Yeah. Uh, so because I like practicing what Guruji taught me, I continue to be able to engage with that. Okay. Um, you know, and at a certain point, it wasn't about learning more anymore. It was about kind of learning better. Mm. Mm. Interesting. Okay, so I want to talk to you about Nama Rupa. Okay. Um, uh, which I love. Nama Rupa, for those of you who don't know, is, is a publication that Eddie is the co-editor and founder of? Co-editor, co-publisher, co-founder. Right. And um, I really admire that project so much because it's really um, that and, and, and Sutra Journal um, are really um, publications that I admire and aspire to with embodied philosophy. So, um, so I want to talk about um, what your inspiration was behind uh, creating this project. And then maybe, and maybe we could start with just talking about what is Nama and Rupa? Okay. Nama means name. Rupa means form. Anything in the manifest universe which can be named or seen has a name and a form. Therefore, it is illusory in nature. Um, it is bound by change, and our attachment or identification with it is only bound to lead us into bondage with name and form. So name and form is almost not quite opposite, but it's a superficial covering over our true nature, mm. which doesn't have name, which doesn't have form, which doesn't change, which isn't bound and was never free, in fact. So um, in this magazine, Namarupa, what we do is we look at all the different um, Hindu and Indian and yogic philosophical and practical systems that, um, that we like, that we <laughs> admire, that come our way, that we're enticed by, uh, as well as a lot of art, photography, and stuff like that. Mm. Um, the magazine was the idea of my friend Robert Moses. In a former life, Robert Moses was Swami Shankarananda, who was a Swami for 23 years at Shivananda, and he was my teacher for my teacher training. And then he later left the ashram and got married and had three kids, and uh, we remained friends during all of his transition time. And around 2002 or so, um, we were discussing about how um, unpleasant yoga journal had become from what it had been in the 1980s and that there didn't seem to be anything out there which was 
a, a magazine for serious philosophical mm. or yogic thought. And originally it was? It was pretty... Yoga Journal was really cool in the early days. Wow. Yeah, if you, you can go online and, and find some 1980s issues, and there was some great stuff. You know, it was just started by um, Judith Lassiter and... Yeah. Um, who was the other woman? So Rama Jyoti Vernon, I mm. think. I can't remember. What happened and, uh, to it? Oh, you know, <laughs> you, there's a saying. You want to know how to make $100,000 in publishing magazines? Spend $500,000. So publishing a magazine is like the most unprofitable and uneconomical thing to do next to owning a print newspaper. Right. Um, it's really difficult to make money. The only way you make money is by selling advertisements. And so that's what eventually they had to do to keep the magazine going, was sell advertisements. And the name of the game in advertising is the newest, the brightest, the most beautiful to entice people to think them, to make them think that they don't have enough, they're not good enough, they're not beautiful enough, they don't have the right gear, they need to buy it in order to feel whole, complete, spiritual, uh, youthful, vibrant, and alive. <laughs> so that's the name of the game in advertising, even in yoga advertising. Um, so this contributes to this culture that, you know, that we see around us where we think, ah, oh, this really isn't what I got into it for, you yeah. know, $90 yoga mats. Um, so we looked at all of that and we thought we should start something where we can, you know, collect articles from people we really admire who maybe aren't being published or are, but people aren't reading them. And we're going to do an advertisement-free journal and we're going to try to do serious philosophy and serious art. And um, we were a print magazine for a couple of years, and then we decided to go online only, I think about seven or eight years ago. You can still get the physical copies, though, correct? You can. Yeah. So the whole magazine right now is an online magazine, but we have a print-on-demand version where there's something a company called MagCloud, and you click on the version of our magazine you want or the issue you want. It goes to MagCloud. MagCloud will print one copy for you and mail it to your house, and so we don't waste any paper and their printing quality is really good. Awesome. Um, so, but really, Robert Moses does most of the work. Like, he does all the layout, he does all the design, he takes care of the mailing list. I collect some articles and submit stuff, and I don't do much for it's I mean, but it's, it's really he great. He does a great job. But thank you for being um, a part of it. Uh, our new issue just came out. Mm -hmm. um, it's, uh, anyone here heard of the Bhagavatam? It's all the stories of Krishna mm -hmm. um, from the time he was a boy till uh, later periods. It's quite a big, big book, and it's one of the most revered books for all the Vaishnavas. And there's an artist in South India named Keshav, who's also a cartoon artist for a local newspaper. No, Times of India, which isn't even local. It's like one of India's biggest newspapers. And he does something called Krishna a Day, where he paints a picture of Krishna every day, wow. and then he sends it out to his mailing list. And wow. um, so when Robert was in India a couple years ago, or a year and a half ago, he went to meet Keshav in his house in Madras or in Chennai. And Keshav had this huge painting on his wall of all of the stories of the Bhagavatam. Mm. And, and so Robert took photographs of it and said, can we do something on this in the magazine? And it ended up turning into an entire issue of our magazine so that all of the stories that are on there, like the, you know, there's a little picture and then it, you know, it's pulled out. And um, the story that accompanies the picture is, is a dresser. So the whole magazine issue is basically the stories of the Bhagavatam with these paintings that go along with it. It's wow. really, really beautiful. It's beautiful. Yeah. And that's namarupa.com. You can find that right now. Namarupa.org. Org. Whoops. Yeah. Exactly. So um, the, the subtitle of that magazine is Categories of Indian Thought. So I'm wondering, um, I'm, I'm kind of curious what you think... Um, and this is sort of a general, if I can be permitted, a kind of generalization about Indian thought. I'm using air quotes, those of you who are listening. Um, what do we stand to gain from an engagement with Indian thought um, as practitioners? I know that's a really big question. Well, a lot. Um, <laughs> the entire yoga tradition, mm -hmm. the bhakti tradition, the Vedanta tradition, the Sankhya traditions, traditions of art, of dance, um, the traditions where... Um, understanding consciousness, expressing different forms of consciousness were at the root of the practices. Yeah. And I think a lot of the um, Indian thought systems are about examining where consciousness shows itself um, in the world through practices or how it can be touched um, you know, individually by us through the different practices and different approaches we have. Mm. So the 
early categorization of Indian philosophy was called the Shat Darshanas, or in a darshan means a viewpoint on reality. Yeah. It also means seeing, it also means philosophy, but more particularly, it's a particular way of looking at reality, and so there's six main different systems. Um, all of those systems, some people say they're intertwined or they complement each other in different ways. Some people say they're grouped together in different ways. Uh, but as a basic idea, you can see that there are different ways of looking at reality, and maybe certain parts of those ways are all going to be shared and will be true, and other of those systems are going to have unique ways of looking at reality and trying to define it. And that it's very difficult for anyone to come up with any agreeable way of deciding what reality is. Yeah. Um, and, um, and of naming it. Yeah. So as soon as you name it, it has a form. And that name and that form is going to change. Um, well, hence the name Nama Rupa. Mm -hmm. uh, but nevertheless, we have to use language. We have to use our bodies. We have to use all the faculties we have, even our unseen faculties like our mind and our breath in order to try to understand consciousness. Mm -hmm. um, so all of these categories that we have in our subtitle deal with what are the different ways in India that they did this. Yeah. They did it through postures, they did it through breath, they did it through discussion, through philosophy, through singing, through chanting, through dance, through music, through art, mm -hmm. through medicine, Ayurveda, through Jyotish, astrology, mm -hmm. um, through all these different types of things. But they all, they all share something, yeah. which is who are we? What are we doing here? You know, what do we do next? Mm -hmm. What I love about that uh, that way of looking at things is, that, I mean, because I'm trained in Western philosophy, and that whole tradition is all about um, subverting the people that come before. So it's like, okay, they were wrong for this and that reason. This is right, and then somebody comes along and says, no, that was wrong, and it continue and goes on like that. And the whole process, the whole the whole engagement, is a process of tearing people down and putting something up and tearing people yeah. and putting something up. Whereas in Indian thought, it seems like it's, it's affirming. It's so much more affirmative. It's like affirming that there is truth here. Like, let's look at the ways in which this perspective on reality holds truth from a certain perspective. And so there's like an embrace of, of different uh, approaches rather than a desire to, you know, slam somebody down. Yeah, over, over all there is a lot more of that, but there also is a lot of slamming down in right. the Indian tradition too and in the Buddhist tradition as well. Um, and the Hindu and Buddhist, both, they both do those things also. They do argue, yeah. But, um, but within the Hindu tradition, there is a little bit more um, of this affirming type of a, of a way of going about it. Yeah. yeah. Not completely, but for the most part, yeah. Awesome. So, okay, let's shift gears a lot because I want to squeeze this in before we get to our Q&A, which is a discussion about injury, which we okay. talked about, talking about on the phone. So, um, Ashkanga gets thrown under the bus quite a bit um, f uh, by those who are concerned about injury in, in asana practice. Um, so, thoughts on that, about does Ashtanga injure people or do people injure people? Well, um, a little of both. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the poses in Ashtanga yoga are difficult. And um, even if you have a very good teacher, sometimes you might get hurt. Um, for some people, they can have uh, an injury which lasts for some time, months or years, and other people, it's minor things that go away. There was a big study done in Finland a bunch of years ago that saw that the rate of injury in Ashtanga yoga measured over a 1,000 people was um, statistically insignificant in comparison with other types of yoga or other types really? of exercise. And that's a published study. You can see it on the all-knowing, always correct internet. <laughs> <laughs> and um, what, was, so what was the name of that study again? So I can't we can remember, but okay. just Google, Google it. Finland Ashtanga Yoga okay. Injury, and it'll come up. Amazing. Um, so, um, you know, it's, it's possible to teach people without them getting hurt. Mm -hmm. It's not always possible for people to not hurt themselves because um, they want to do more than they should be. And it's also possible for teachers to be uh, aggressive or over-enthusiastic and hurt people who even are trying to practice in a very prudent kind of a way. Mm -hmm. So uh, again, a lot of it is teacher dependent. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of that is not going to be necessarily just from how their teacher taught them, but from their own awareness that they bring to their teaching style. Mm -hmm. Guruji was 
sometimes very tough on us um, and um, sometimes he wasn't and there are some teachers who take that side of him that was very tough and use that as their whole way of approaching class all the time yeah. for everybody um, and then there are other people who um, didn't take that and they saw that he was tough with some people and not tough with others and that's what they took as their mm -hmm. teaching style and other people um, took their own experience of how they thought practice should be which had nothing to do with how Guruji helped people and made that their teaching style and all of those different styles have people who come to their classes and still hurt themselves somehow uh, hurting yourself doing anything is extremely easy <laughs> so uh, hurting yourself in yoga can happen specifically um, through any false move um, you may be a perfectly structurally sound person but make a false move either in a yoga pose or walking down the street mm -hmm. and end up hurting yourself yeah. um, so we try to move in such a way in yoga where we're aware of our breath and aware of our body um, and uh, the unfortunate part of it is that our bodies are not perfect machines mm -hmm. and so no matter what happens we're always in the danger of having something happen so then the, the trick is to it I think there are two important sides of it number one um, if a student gets hurt in a class is the teacher able to help them if a teacher is helping a student and they get hurt while like I'm helping you in something and I hurt you in something um, you know, aside from being sorry and, and, and apologetic, can I help you? Um, can I help fix the thing which I helped to break? <laughs> and if I can't help to fix it, can I send you in the right direction to, and know people who will be able to help you? Mm -hmm. I think this is an important part. It's not spoken about a lot, but I think if you break something, you should be able to fix it. Right. And you shouldn't break something so badly that you have no idea how to fix it. If you break something so badly, you have no idea how to fix it, and there wasn't a pre-existing condition in that person, then you have to question your teaching method mm. um, and reassess. So uh, that's one side of it. And um, I can't remember what the other side of it was. Okay. I was talking too much. <laughs> no. Do you think... Um, you guys like getting sleepy now? Do you need a break or coffee or... We're going we're gonna to switch to Q&A in just a second, but I wanted to ask um, if you... Do you think that there are psychological types or physical types that are not conducive to the Ashtanga practice? Like I'm thinking... As a type A person myself, I uh, have have gone to Ashtanga a number of times and, and practiced for a period of time. And, and each time that I do, I uh, I think my type A like kicks in where I'm looking to like it's e easy to think about that practice as accumulation because you're like I got to get that next pose. I want to get in there and get that next pose and get given another pose so I can keep evolving and improving. Whereas if I'm doing if I'm coming to, I don't know, um, a vinyasa class with my friend Rebecca here, I don't know what I'm getting, and it's not necessarily a kind of accumulative approach, so it doesn't tap into that desire to get more. Um, so I don't know uh, if that was a question, but do you have any thoughts on that? <laughs> yeah, I think it's very good to tap into that desire to want to get more and to realize that it exists in you, mm -hmm. and how are you going to deal with it? Um, if it arises, that means that it's in you, and therefore, you're going to have to confront it one day or another. Mm -hmm. And so it's a good place to confront it is on the yoga mat and mm -hmm. resist it um, or explore it yeah. um, or just allow it to be there and not have to act on it. Mm -hmm. um, one of the good things about having a practice where you know what you're doing next is that you don't have to think about it. Um, and therefore, not having to think about the form anymore, you can think about your experience and about what's happening internally. Mm -hmm. um, if you are doing a physical practice where you don't know what's coming next. There are also mental and emotional benefits to that as well. Um, but one benefit that you don't necessarily get, you might, but um, you might not necessarily get it, but you might get it, is that um, you won't allow yourself to get very subtle with that thing because maybe it's the only time you're doing it. Yeah. Or you do it every once in a while. It, but it's through repetition that we get subtle. So if you have a mantra, like everyone's familiar with mantra practice, when you have a mantra that you are chanting or pronouncing or saying quietly, you, didn't, you don't change your mantra every few days. You don't go, okay, I'm going to chant Om Namah Shivaya for a few days, and now I'm going to switch to Om Gangana Namaha. 
you, you're given a mantra, maybe like one particular bijo or a phrase, and you repeat it again and 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 again. Sometimes you get super bored, sometimes you're enthusiastic, sometimes the mantra disappears and you're just in like, you know, the zone. Um, but you repeat it because that repetition is going to have a change on your field of consciousness on a cellular level. So usually most practices are repetitive to get us out of that part of our mind which has to think about what comes next mm. so that we can experience something more subtle. When you do ritual, ritual is always the same. Mm -hmm. And you do it because at a certain point you're supposed to get bored so you can go past boredom. Mm. You know, you want to go past boredom, you want to go past excitement, you want to go past everything until you just go past, mm. until you're just there, um, present. And so uh, getting onto your mat, knowing precisely what you're supposed to do, trying to do it in that particular way, is basically to put you in a particular frame of mind to be receptive to inner awareness of what processes are happening. So I don't think it's necessarily better or worse, but I think there are certain things that you get to experience through deciding to make something your practice and sticking with it. Yeah. Um, we can still learn a lot of things from a lot of different ways of doing things, but a practice means this is where I center myself. This is where when I do it, automatically all my attention and all my energy begins to move in one direction, inward, not in a lot of different directions, distracted. Um, and that's the essential purpose of having a practice. Mm -hmm. So when people come to um, our school, then you know we say that we like them to be there for a minimum of 10 classes when they're first starting because see how it feels to develop a practice. If that's not what you want to develop, then that's fine. Um, but you can't be here and not want to develop one because you won't learn anything. Mm. Um, you can't just drop in every few months and expect to get benefit from the practice. It's because practice is internal. Mm. Uh, it's not this external thing you do every once in a while. Mm. It's all the internal things that say, I'm going to go on my mat again today, do the same damn thing. Yeah. Um, and be present with it and not let it feel mundane. Yeah. Playing scales over and over again if you're a piano player. I hated that. Yeah. I feel like that's a really important reminder for all of us, uh, especially in, you know, I th uh, it seems like increasingly we get easily distracted. We want the next best thing. So something like discipline and sticking to something, even when, you, as you were saying, the mantra gets boring or the practice gets boring, mm -hmm. you still have that wherewithal to continue mm -hmm. working with the practice rather than, you know, seeking out what is going to, you know, excite you mm -hmm. in the same way that it, you know, maybe did at the beginning. People say like, okay, I understand this idea that um, doing a practice is like practicing scales. But if you're practicing scales on a piano or a guitar, eventually you get to play a symphony or play like a whole rock mm. song. So when do I get to play like a symphony? <laughs> well, that's what life is for, you know? Yeah. That's, that's what you do on your yoga mat is you're practicing your scales so that you're prepared for the symphony of life. That's where it's gonna happen, you know? It's not just gonna happen there by doing a cool posture. That was the perfect place to end the official interview. What a, a perfect way to end it. Um, so before we get into the Q&A, will you just share with the listeners where they can find out more about you and if you have any events, workshops, retreats that are coming up that you might want to share? Um, I'd be happy to. This is the first time I've ever been asked to do that, I think. Oh, <laughs> really? Well, you can follow me on Instagram. At, actually, you can. Instagram's <laughs> my favorite thing. Is it? Uh, in, in regards to social media, I really <laughs> like Instagram. So on Instagram, I'm at Eddie Stern. And um, the, um, uh, I'm on Twitter also. I don't do it much. And also on Twitter, I'm at Eddie Stern. Okay. And um, I just um, uh, uh, took sannyas or renunciation from Facebook, so I'm not using that anymore. Oh. Um, and I didn't take a real sannyas. Don't worry. I know. I thought you I said know. Facebook like gave you the sannyas. So no, they like didn't. They, they didn't. <laughs> they didn't. Uh, I just it was just one thing too many for me to not keep yeah, up with. It's a lot. And I ju I can't keep up with all these things. So <laughs> I just said, okay, that's fine. Set it to rest. Exactly. It's so hard to deactivate like a Facebook account. Have you tried? You can like take a break, but they don't want you to like completely cut it off. Well, the thing that was frustrating was that I have like a yoga school page and a personal page. The yoga school page has been activated by my personal account, and I can't figure out how to deactivate the yoga school page. So anytime, so I deactivated my personal one, but anytime I log in to try to deactivate 
the other one, then it reactivates my personal page. <laughs> it's really it's tricky. It's a conspiracy. It must be. So, okay, so Instagram. Yep. Um, and uh, I teach workshops. Um, I have some coming up this year in um, Stockholm at the end of this month, and then Miami in February, and then Milan in March, and um, Buenos Aires in April, Ooh. and uh, Croatia uh, in Zagreb in June, and then I'm here all of July, and um, Moscow and Siberia in um, what do you call it, August, and in September, nothing right now, and then October, I'll go to Amsterdam again, and then I'm home for November, December, and onwards. Wow, so you're getting around. So where I, can I usually, like, once per month, I go away for four days to teach somewhere. Amazing. So where can people find out about those offerings? On brooklynyogaclub.com, which okay. is our website, and otherwise, I'm in Brooklyn teaching every day. Yeah. Saturday is my day off, um, but every, uh, today's Saturday, right? So today is, you know, I came, came out, out. I came, came out for you. Thank you for coming on your day and, off. And um, the but every other day I'm teaching in the school. That's okay. like what I like to do. Awesome. Well, everybody, there you have it. That was our interview with Ashtanga yoga teacher Eddie Stern. I hope you enjoyed it. If you would like to hear the Q and A uh, that took place after this interview recording, just head to eddiestern.embodiedphilosophy.com. Click on the button there and sign up to receive the audio sent directly to your email inbox. If you'd like to hear more about Eddie, of course, you can head to brooklynyogaclub.com. Until next time, friends, bye-bye. <laughs>